Big names who had magic moments in the 1969 U.S. Open at Champions, Texas. Jack Nicklaus wasn't having his best year, but you never knew when a golden bear might come up with magic. Millard Barber seemed to be in command after three rounds. This drive was pretty good, but Barber's putt was sensational. Barber found himself in the trees on 12, and he pitched right into a bunker. It would not be his day. And then Orville Moody came out of the shadows. A pro only since 67, and an Army enlisted man for 14 years before that, Moody's steady if unspectacular play paid off over the long haul. Orville Moody won the U.S. Open by one stroke and became the surprise hero of 1969. This was the magic moment of 1969, July 20th. The lunar module Eagle approaches the moon's surface. We all held our breath and waited. Forward. That's 40 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. Four forward. Four forward, drifting to the right a little. That's eight. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. A Magic Ears Challenge. The final out of the 69 World Series, a soft fly to Cleon Jones. A man who hit that ball would one day wear a Met uniform. Who was it? Threes. And in 1984, he became manager of the New York Mets. And defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Richard Nixon became America's 37th president in 69 and later shared some thoughts on the national pastime. Baseball is great because anything can happen up through the ninth inning. It is great also because everybody knows it's an honest game. Uh, and it's great, too, because the men who play it and the men who are in it, and I should say now we're looking at the owner of the Mets, the women that are in it, uh, that, as far as baseball is concerned, uh, that those who are in baseball are people that we can look up to. No one looked up to the New York Mets in their first seven years of existence. They seemed cursed to wallow in the basement of the National League for years to come. But in 1969, something magical happened at Chase Stadium. The break started to go the Mets' way. A team that had never finished better than night rose to greatness. Some called it a miracle. But was it a miracle team or a talented club whose time had come? Star of the Year, Tom Seaver, still plying his trade, remembered. Uh, in 1969, we were a ball club that uh, kind of gelled and came together and played very well defensively and, and were better offensively than a lot of people gave us credit for. Tom Agee was a really a, uh, a special kind of athlete. He, uh, he had tremendous physical skills, extremely strong. Uh, Don Clendenin, who, who was at the tail end uh, of uh, a very fine career that started in Pittsburgh. We had an excellent defensive catcher, Jerry Grody. We had the basis of an outstanding ball club because we had great starting pitching. Uh, you take Tom Seaver and Jerry Kuzman and Nolan Ryan, who were three pitchers on that ball club, uh, and between us, when we retire, we're going to have close to 800 victories. We had good relief in Ron Taylor and Tug McGraw, the first two guys out of the, the bullpen in short situations. From a ball club consistency standpoint, 
are the things that, uh, that, that make ball clubs winners. And it's very difficult to go down and find ball clubs that do not have strengths from a, from a pitching standpoint, catching shortstop and center field, and we have those. Seaver won 25 games for the Mets in 69. The Cy Young winner was routinely terrific. And on July 9th, he was almost perfect. The so-called imperfect game, and uh, you know, there was a, uh, quite a bit written about it in New York. We were playing the Cubs in New York, uh, and it was the bottom of the uh, ninth inning. And we were in the middle of, of a pennant race, and, and uh, we were hit four to nothing. And uh, I got to the bottom of the ninth inning, and uh, top of the ninth inning, and I had one out, and Jimmy Qualls got a single to left center field and hit it very sharply. Tom fell just short that night. But the drive and brilliance that brought him so close was a constant inspiration to his Met teammates as they took the division flag and went on to face Hank Aaron and the Braves in the playoffs. Aaron hammered three homers in the series, but it was the Mets who were overpowering. They swept the Braves in three, and it was on to the World Series against the Baltimore Orioles. The birds had it all, defense, pitching, power, and Tom Seaver found out how much power in game one. Ron Svoboda's fielding magic was yet to come. Don Buford circled the bases, and the Orioles built a 4-0 lead. But Mike Quaylar got in trouble in the seventh. Jerry Brody singled here as the New Yorkers built a threat. A great pickup and throw by Brooks Robinson would rob the Mets of a big inning. We were in the ball game. And I think maybe in the back of all our minds, we thought we were going to get blown out. Where in fact, we lost game one and walked in the clubhouse and said, we almost won that game. You know, we can, we can, we can beat these guys. In game two, Don Clendenin took a Dave McNally serve downtown. Frank Robinson watched it go. The Mets could beat these guys, and they did in a 2-1 squeaker. The series went to Shea for game three, and the day belonged to Tommy Agee. Agee leads off the game against Jim Palmer. And you can kiss that one goodbye. built a three-run lead, and as the birds threatened in the fourth and seventh, Tommy Agee showed he was truly an amazing net. Uh, you watch a player and you play with him for a year, and, and of course that was the second year that I played with Tommy, and you knew what you know what they can do and you know what they can't do. And the two catches that he made, I knew he was going to make them, uh, because you just know how fast an individual runs and, and, and the distance that he has to cover, and you know that he's going to make the, the, the play. You know he'll make the play. And Tommy always had uh, a little habit right before he catched the ball, he would, he would hit his glove, he would count his hand in his glove. And if you look at the film, and, and right before he catches the ball, uh, he, would, he, would, he would hit his glove, and even on the diving catches, he was hitting his glove, knowing that he was going to catch those balls. He was a very, very important member of that ball club. John Clendenin faced Mike Cuellar in the second inning of game four. A towering shot to left gave the Mets a one nothing lead. Seaver made that lead hold up until the ninth. But then Tom Terrific needed some help. And he got it from the right fielder, Ron Svoboda. Uh, Boo Powell hit a hopper over the first baseman's head. And Robinson went to third. Frank Robinson went to third. And then Brooks Robinson came up and hit a line drive uh, into right center field. And at first, I couldn't believe he was going to try and make the play. But uh, unbelievable the catch he made the catch. That was uh, one, of the, you know, one of the phenomenal plays in World Series history. The Mets won game four in 10 innings. They went out nine innings away from doing the impossible. Svoboda up eighth inning, game five. With the score tied, he strokes one down the left field line. It drops in. Cleon Jones comes in with the go-ahead run. 
Ninth inning, two outs, one more needed to make the Mets immortal. After game one, we really felt we were going to be world champions, but it was the excitement of it all and knowing that, that the final out had finally come and that we were, in fact, world champions, and it was a great feeling. And 1969 was a magic year for me, not only for me, but for all of us on the New York Mets becoming world champions. And I say it was a magic time and a very special time because we basically were a young ball club and, and uh, one of the things that you do when you are a youngster playing Little League Baseball, you, you want to be a champion.